Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Welcome to the Fly With Us podcast. This podcast is bringing the art of conversation, self-love, self-care, mental health care and protection, life lessons, love lessons, and everything in between. Today, we're going to talk about doing good and being good. I'm Lady Bounce. And I am Picket Fence. Today's Mindfulness Minute is called For the Good of All. I cultivate silence, resolve within myself to work for a better world. I cast aside criticism and doubt, and I been, begin quietly working for transformation. The situation of humanity on the planet could not be more per- precarious. Our, e- our, excuse me, our ecidal civilizations are on the brink of a tipping point that could destroy the life support system in which we're living in depend which living in depends we really could lose our clean air our drinking water our arable land our society stability in order for humanity to have a chance we have to return to the sense of sacred value of the earth we have to return to an inner connection with nature We must once again value nature's beauty and the right of all beings to the means of life. In the stillness of this hour, pledge yourself to working for the good of all beings, human and non-human. Pledge your life and labor for the healing of the earth, for just the relationships between nations, for the better life for all creatures. Fill this vow with penetrating your entire being, growing stronger within you, radiating outward into everything that you do. Word up. Word up. So, but before we dive deep, why did you choose that? What, what, what does that say to you? What's it speaking to you? Well, I mean, I, I look around and it just seems like the world is in a decay right now especially when you look at society norms. You know, I had a post the other day, you know, because I mean, it was new to me, but I, from the post and the comments on the post, I realized that it wasn't new to a lot of people. And the post was about, I couldn't understand why there are now eighth grade graduations. Cause in my time, there wasn't a such thing as eighth grade graduations. Um, I lived in a suburbs for a while and in that suburbs, you went at school was set up from kindergarten to fifth grade. Then you went to middle school, sixth and seventh grade. Junior high was eighth and ninth grade. And then you just went over to the high school. Um, before I even got to that level, I moved to another area called Northridge in the sixth grade. And in that area, they just had elementary, middle school and high school, which middle school was sixth, seventh and eighth grade. And you just went over to the high school. So eighth grade graduations and kindergarten graduations were something that I wasn't used to. And it just seemed funny to me. And and I was thinking about that along with it just seems like, uh, you know, we have this everybody gets a trophy society that we live in now. Mm -hmm. And it just seems like if you're always just um, saying everything's okay, and, and we have like a to me, it seemed like, you know, like I said, after seeing the post, maybe I was wrong, but I, you know, I'm an instant conspiracy theory type of person. It just seems like we're lowering our expectations. And, you know, and after seeing all the comments, I think maybe maybe I'm being a little too critical because for some people, it seemed like this was a normal thing. And I saw some people like even my cousin said we should celebrate every step. And But then I saw another cousin said, I think that if we do that, then they don't have anything to um, achieve for. So it just seems like it, there's just a big imbalance of things now. And then, you know, and another post brings to mind that you saw a friend uh, posted a video of a, a girl rapping and uh, what well, I'm not, you know, it's a, this is a family show, so I won't use the word, but it was innerish type of behavior. But to me, that's 90% of the music now. She said it was demonic and, ill-spirited but that seemed like the song after viewing i had never heard of the girl rapping i'd never seen the video i heard like the chorus on like little people have been using the chorus for their like little tiktoks or whatever i see them like in other clips video clips and stuff 
of like highlight reels and stuff like that. But it didn't seem any worse than most of the stuff that's out there now. So what that mindfulness minute means to me is about, you know, for me personally, to stop trying to be so critical and dive deep within myself to really find um, what I might find as viable solutions to bring a better world because right now it just seems to me like it's so much imbalance i mean we've had what three or four mass shootings in the last two or three weeks Uh um we've had skyrocketing prices in the last few weeks you know i work in um the international market and every other day prices are jumping I got gas for four thirty-five the other day, and now it's like five dollars. Two days ago, um, and now it's five dollars. So it's just like everything's kind of seems like imbalanced right now. And I think you know, instead of just being so critical about it, that it's time for everybody to dive deeper into their self and really find you know better solutions. Because everybody thinks they have the answers, but like Kanye told Sway, you ain't got the answers. You ain't got the answers. So, so what what does the mindfulness minute say to you? Um, to me, it 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 says you know that that all things are connected, and I think like what you said, we've kind of lost our interconnectedness. We've lost our connection with the environment. We've lost our connection with each other as as people, as humans, and without sounding like you know the the bible thumpers of the world there has to be some kind of reckoning at some point there has to be an awakening um for us as as people to realize that this path that we are going down is detrimental to both us and the planet that we call home and it, mm-hmm. it's a two it becomes a twofold issue in the sense that we're not taking care of our environment. So we're mm-hmm. not going to have a planet to live on soon mm-hmm. anyway. We're depleting all of its resources because we are, you know, greedy and the ultimate consumers of everything. And because we're so hell bent on consuming that we're not being mindful, you know, in the sense of taking care of our world and taking care of our environment. And because we're we're so con- consumed with consuming we're also not taking care of each other as people we're not holding each other accountable for the things that make our world or that is supposed to make our world a better place Mm -hmm. we're not saying to people hey pick that trash up and throw it away wherever you're going to when you go to throw trash out like your car window for example wherever you're going to i'm sure has a trash can so there's right. no need to throw it out the window. But if I pull a motorist over and I say, hey, pick that up, or if I pick up the trash and I hand it back to them, then I got a whole other issue on my hands that becomes a safety issue. I may get shot. I may get killed just for trying to to hold my brother or my sister, you know, my fellow human accountable for taking care of our world and taking care of each other. We have this whole thing Well, you know, it used to be, you know, it takes a village to raise a child. Well, we've been very fortunate that we built a village for both of our children. But I've also seen this meme floating around Facebook that says the village stopped helping to raise kids when the parents started trying to fight the villagers. So when when Mm. we started Mm. not allowing each other to hold our kids accountable for their behaviors, and it became a negative thing, then like the whole world's just gone haywire now. And so you were talking about that music video and, and, and we watched it and I didn't see anything more demonic, so to speak, than any other rap video. I I didn't see anything that was Not shocking. Him. I think just because our world has gone so far to the other side, I don't think there's anything I could see on a music video that would shock me. You know, and that doesn't mean I want people to go out and try to shock me. Right, right, you know right. And like, I don't think that there's anything I could see in a video or hear in a song that would shock me. Because there are, are 
things that used to be you know not acceptable to talk about or taboo so to speak to talk about but nowadays it's like there's no filter on anything and we all seem to walk around with this who gonna check me kind of attitude mm -hmm. which is detrimental to you as a person is detrimental to our world as a whole and it's certainly detrimental to to any youth that you have the fortunate to be around so if you you know are allowed to be around a youth or mentor youth be related to any of these young people and you don't use that opportunity to teach and help them grow and be better then you know you're kind of like you're wasting your time and your space in their life like we just i don't know what the answer is but we have to start to get back to you know accountability for for the space that we take up on the planet and, and i think that's a hard battle because you have a, a youth now that has been told that no one should tell you anything you're in total control. You should say so everything about yourself. You don't have to listen to anybody. You're self-made. You govern your own self. Don't listen to anybody. You, nobody could tell you anything. And then you have this whole, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, you always say it. Uh, entitlement. And, and, oh, yeah, and check me. Entitlement. entitlement. You know, so it's like, it's a hard battle. And like, you know, when you do the things that we do, like with this program and you being an intervention specialist and me being a natural health consultant, it's like sometimes you get to the point where you get tired of beating a dead horse. It's like nobody's listening anyway. So how do you how do you and can you push through that? And I think that's one thing that brings me back to the thing like maybe it's time to dive deep into ourselves because like and i'll quote it again it says that the it says this ecological ecocidal civilization is on a brink of a tipping point that could destroy the life support system on which all living things depend so it's like we're so about self and this super ego which we all need some piece of ego but we are all operating at a super ego level that we don't realize that we are destroying our own environments. We're destroying our own makeups. I mean, people don't look at the earth as being alive itself. And like the quote said, it's time that we return to valuing that earth is sacred. It's just as much as you value yourself is sacred. You know, and, and lower that ego and realize that we are all existing in the same time and space and it's important for all of us to to uh not only not only hold each other accountable but hold yourself accountable so i think it's maybe time that i take from that quote is that maybe it's time to fall back and just dive deeply into yourself and really pay attention to what's going on in your environment your own homes um and and, and uh, on a global scale also i think so but i i want to to be cautious though when diving deep into oneself which is definitely mm -hmm. needed you got to be careful not to go so deep that you forget that you are connected you know to to the others in this world and and don't forget that you know you have gifts that have to be given to the world and they can only be given to the mm -hmm. world through you and if you dive so deep into yourself that you forget that you you may lose some of the connectedness which mm -hmm. in some way some of the connectedness you do want to lose because it's wild and crazy out here and i totally get that but i also on the flip side of that think that we we have to keep pushing and even when it's when it's hardest you got to keep pushing like you can't um well i won't say you can't i'll say i'm not willing to give up mm -hmm. and as i go deeper into myself i'm going deeper into myself to pull out the tools that you know may be dormant inside of me that i haven't used in a while to still continue with my mission mm -hmm. and I and like that. 
and you know, and given the job that I have, it can be depressing and stressful and nerve wracking and make you want to quit and give up. But deep down, I just feel like the outcome is so much bigger than me that I can't just bury my head in the sand and and not do the work because there's so many people out here that are not doing the work as it relates to you know to to kids in general but definitely you know high school kids and kids in school just trying to make it and get through there's not enough of us out here for me to be able to give up so i like that yeah i like that and i like that you know that ties into how the um mindfulness men ended it says pledge your life and labor for the healing of the earth for just relations between nations, for a better life of all creatures. Feel this vow penetrating your entire being, growing stronger within you and radiating outward into everything that you do. So that, you know, it says what you're saying that, you know, you got to dive within, but you have to utilize your gifts and, and, and let them show outward. So, so the question will be is in times of frustration, what do you use for motivation to keep doing that? Um, I just think about the, I try to focus on the positive. I try to think about the outcome. I try to think about, um, you know, how good it feels when my kids have graduated. And regardless of what they choose to do after graduation, that moment that, that day, like that whole day, I'm jittery, I'm shaky, you know, I can't eat, I have all of this nervous energy. I'm so excited for my kids. I'm sometimes more excited, you know, than they are, or maybe even more excited than their parents because I've seen how hard they've worked to get there. Mm. And so I try to hold on to that feeling. And in times of when it's not graduation time, I just try to hold on to the successes that my kids do have. When that light bulb moment happens, when a kid who's been struggling with algebra for the last two years, like finally gets it, I'm holding on to that feeling. I'm holding on to, you know, when when kids bring me gifts and tell me I'm their favorite teacher, or when when a kid says, you know, I love you, you know, and I, I appreciate what you've done for me. And, you know, and I often laugh it off and joke it off and be like, ah, oh, you don't love me. You know, you don't care about me, but they, they really do care and they do express that they care and that they appreciate it. So I hold on to that, to know that what I'm doing, albeit very stressful, it's not being done in vain, that the kids are getting something out of it. There is a value, you know, added to their lives. Their families appreciate it. I often get told, you know, by parents, thank you for all you've done. Like at graduation last week, it was, it was so incredible the number of parents who were like, if it wasn't for you, he wouldn't be graduating. If it wasn't for you, she wouldn't have walked across that stage and I appreciate you. So I just try to hold on to that. But I'll, I'll say that it it's hard because midway through the year when I'm hitting my, my wall or my frustration period, it is hard to keep holding on to, you know, to the hope and to the positivity. But because I work so hard doing the self work, even if I let myself have a day or two where I'm being sad or down or negative, I never let it last more than that because I know that I have a tendency to go down that rabbit hole of negativity that serves me no purpose on the other side of it. So I try to stop doing things that are a waste of my energy and that, that don't bring me, you know, joy and positivity in some form or fashion. Mm -hmm. So how and you know and that's I think that's very good for like um, you know aspect of children. But how do we keep pushing for adults? Because you know once you become an adult and you're set in your ways, how do you affect change in adults? Because some of these that's, adults they like the nigger room. They they do. So in that regard, there are some some people you know you're not ever going to be able to pull them. There are some that, you know, are just always going to be out there in the land of the lost. You just got to keep plugging away, doing what you can do in the circle of people you're connected to. And 
in a lot of ways, if you're connected to some youth and your message is getting through to those youth, sometimes it's a trickle up effect that when you're impacting the life of a youth, that that may motivate the parents or the other adult somewhere in their life to, you know, to get better, to, to change a little bit, you know, not, nothing's going to be, you know, overnight. You got to think people didn't this terrible behavior that people seem to be laced with didn't happen overnight. It was a gradual process. So if we continue to keep putting good out in the world, putting good into these kids is at some point, the adults have to stop and listen. Some of our greatest, you know, movements, even during the civil rights movement was led by children. So, you know, the, the children have a voice. They have to be listened to. And because they, they have a sense of freedom that we adults don't have, they can be unapologetic in how they get their message across or how they get their needs met from the adults in their lives. So I just think if, if we keep pushing and enough of us are pushing, the negativity can't last. It has to come to a, a point like a pimple where it has to pop because it's not going to be able to withstand the pressure of the good that's being put out. Word. Yeah, I like those. I like you made some real good points. Um, I think that uh, one of the hardest battle is um, we know the youth are being programmed a certain way, but so are adults. They're being programmed a certain way. And I was watching a real good interview with uh, Billy Carson and 19 Keys where they're talking about, which this is not just them. You can look it up for yourself. Scientists have known for years that your DNA is basically recording information from generation to generation. And that information stays in your DNA. Mm -hmm. And what African-Americans and African brothers and sisters have gone through in this country is going to be encoded on our children, our children's children, our children's children's children, unless we start reprogramming that DNA, which mm -hmm. it is possible for us to reprogram our DNA. But one thing we have to do is we have to start controlling the programming. Yes. Right now, we are programming, as so, and excuse the term again, niggified, that it's going to be hard to reprogram ourselves because every popular or hit black movie is either some ghetto stuff or some slave stuff. And that's just encoding our DNA with more trauma mm -hmm. so somehow some way we have to start taking control of our programming and one thing that um billy carson mentioned which any most spiritual teachers whether they be white black indian no matter what talk about affirmations and i made this post a couple of weeks ago on our page about create your own affirmations and say those affirmations every day for 21 days straight and that starts to reprogramming your dna because we intentionally now which most of us don't know that these trauma field things that we get involved with is further damaging our dna and that information is recorded on our DNA and it's passed on down and keeps getting passed down. We keep now we're we have the ability and the knowledge that we can change that. But the point is, when are we going to step up and change that? You know, I think a, a big step in in going forward and changing that. It's something that's really, I don't want to say it's impossible because I don't want to be negative, but it is almost impossible that we control the programming. Mm -hmm. When we can control the programming, then we can control the narrative. We can have a better handle on the outcomes. We can't control the outcome, but we can have a better handle on what the outcome is when we get to a point where we can control our own programming, which you and I often talk about. When it comes to, you know, terrible music that is a detriment to to our society as a whole, not just people of color, but as a whole. The record companies only put out what's being sold, but you can only buy what the record companies put out. 
So here we have this this cycle and this issue. I can only buy what's available, but they only make available what's being bought. Well, I don't think that that's true. I think that record companies are putting out what they want you to consume. Right. And they're paying money for those things to become popular, what they want you to consume. So I have two self-care signs before we get into my favorite part of the show. Okay. First self-care assignment is create an affirmation, a positive affirmation for yourself every morning. Just like Mary says, good morning. What she say? Good morning. Good what morning, in the song? Gorgeous. Good morning. Gorgeous. Look in the mirror and say, good morning. Gorgeous. And say that affirmation to yourself every day. The second thing is look up some new programming, whether it be music, TV show, something that is going to elevate your mind, change the programming, reprogram your DNA. So those are the two self-care assignments for this week. Now let's get into my favorite part of the show. Doom, 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 doom. Brain science, 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 science. All right, so we've been talking about doing good. I'm going to give you seven scientific facts about the benefit of doing good. Have you ever felt the rush after doing a good deed? Ever noticed you were more relaxed after a day of volunteering? Did you ever feel motivated to do good after thinking about the last time you helped someone? If you answer yes to any of these questions, there's a good explanation. It's called science. So, if you are one of those people like me who is always looking for the good and always looking to do good, here are seven reasons why. Doing good decreases your stress. According to a 2013 study examining the relationship between volunteering and hypertension, researchers found that adults over 50 who volunteered for about four hours were 40% less likely than non-volunteers to develop hypertension. Additionally, being generous can have the same effect according to a 2010 study, which found that the less money people gave away, the higher their cortisol levels. Hmm. So we want to lower our cortisol levels because that is the stress inducing hormone. Number two, doing good can increase your life expectancy. The findings studies have been done and the findings show that subjects who provided tangible assistance to friends or family members, like running errands, helping with childcare, et cetera, reported less stressful events and consequently have reduced mortality. In other words, helping others reduce their mortality specifically by buffering the association between stress and mortality. Doing good makes us feel better. You ever felt a rush of performing a good deed? That sensation is known as helper's hop, and it is produced when your brain releases endorphins, the feel-good chemicals of the brain. When you do something good for someone else, your brain's pleasure sensors light up, releasing endorphins and producing this high. Not to mention doing good has also shown to generate feelings of satisfaction and gratitude. Doing good makes us happier at work. Researchers also have found that individuals in their mid-30s who rated helping others in their work as important. They, these people also reported that they were happier with life when they were surveyed 30 years later. Doing good promotes mental health. Wait, wait a minute. The review found that along with improved, improved well-being and life satisfaction, volunteering is also linked to this decreased depression. So usually when you help someone who is in a need or they, they have a need or they are less fortunate than you, it does tend to make you feel better because you feel like you have done something to contribute to the world. So doing good leads to happiness. People who engage in kind acts become happier over time. It's just that simple. Life satisfaction and self-realization and physical health significantly improved when people did good deeds for other people. Last but not least, doing good will motivate you to do good again. Research has found that reflecting on your past good deeds makes you feel selfless and want to help more as compared to reflecting on times others have helped you. In other words, thinking about what you've given others and not only what you've received will motivate you to do good again and again, which goes back to what I said earlier and why I can continue to do what I do on a daily basis because it feels good and I remember it. So I do it again 
because that makes me feel good. Mm-hmm. Word up. I Word. like it. Well, yo, that's our show for this week. You know, if you have any comments or concerns, you can always email us at flywithusla at gmail.com. You can find our podcast wherever you find your favorite podcast. Um, make sure that you share the self-care assignments every day on Facebook. We're also on Facebook under Fly With Us Podcast. And that's our show. It's your boy, Pick a Fence. I'm your girl, Lady Bounce. Hey, and one more thing. If you're watching this before the 17th, make sure you come out and see Lady Bounce at the Barrel House in Dayton, Ohio, where she'll be spinning nothing but bangers. And next month, July 9th, is the return of the Gym City Get Down, a party with a purpose. Word up. And we out of here. Peace. Peace.